Thank you very much to Brendan Lyon, to the many uh, distinguished guests here today, ladies and gentlemen. It is an indeed a pleasure to be at an IPA lunch uh, today of all days, and I'm also very pleased to be given the very important and pleasant task of introducing Howard Collins to you. And before I do that, I want to uh, take a moment to thank all of you for the contribution you're making to turn our transport network into a modern and efficient one in New South Wales. In the audience, I see many familiar faces who are partnering with us in the job of really making uh, our system efficient, modern and customer friendly. And I want to thank you for that. When we came to government, I had no doubt that one of the biggest challenges for me personally and for the government would be to reform the way that we provided rail services in New South Wales. Uh, no doubt uh, that was and still remains a huge challenge for us, but I'm very pleased with the progress we're making. And one of the decisions we made very early on is that if we were serious about making the customer at the centre of everything we did in transport, including rail, we had to change the way that we organised ourselves or structured ourselves. So early on in the piece, we made the decision to discontinue RailCorp and to create two new organisations in Sydney Trains and New South Wales Trains. Sydney Trains to cater for our customers who use trains frequently in the Sydney metropolitan area, and New South Wales Trains to cater for our customers who sit on trains for a few hours a day, uh, whether it's from the Central Coast or the Illawarra or the Blue Mountains. Uh, for example, if you compare what you receive for two hours on a service here in New South Wales to other parts of the world, there's no doubt we had to lift our game. So I'm very pleased that in addition to Howard Collins today, we have the CEO of New South Wales Trains, Rob Mason here, and he's doing a great job in getting that organisation up and running. Uh, so from 1 July, Sydney Trains and New South Wales Trains took effect, and already I think customers are feeling the difference. But uh, our ability to do this really uh, was the culmination of two years of hard work and planning. And not only are we doing well in making sure all our transport projects are on time and on budget, but we're also making sure that we're introducing a number of customer initiatives to really transform the way we provide rail services. And now in establishing or having established Sydney Trains and New South Wales Trains, we can compare how we're going here in New South Wales to other states and indeed to other rail operators around the world. And uh, I can't tell you how thrilled I am that someone of Howard Collins' calibre uh, uh, accepted or, or accepted our invitation to become the CEO of Sydney Trains. Uh, Howard brings with him more than three decades of experience in rail. He brings, and the most uh, recent job he had was um, for nearly six years as a head of operations for the London Underground. In fact, he was so well regarded that the colourful mayor of London, Boris, called him his tube man. And so uh, he often didn't refer to Howard as Mr. Collins or Howard, but you know, my tube man. So I think that's an indication of how highly he was regarded. And in fact, um, last year he was formally awarded an OBE for his contribution to the uh, London Olympics and Paralympics, but also for his contribu contribution to the London Underground. Uh, so Howard not only brings with him a wealth of experience in rail in a number of jurisdictions, but also a very easygoing nature, which uh, lends itself to the fact that I think if you asked him or had a conversation with him, he'd tell you that he's hold, held almost every position there is in the rail network, uh, whether it's uh, on the platform, whether it's in the maintenance yard, or whether it's um, actually uh, doing, uh, doing other things uh, in management. So he brings with him all those uh, years of experience, but also a particular culture. He catches the train every day for a significant distance from where he lives now in Sydney. And I remember when we were convincing him to take up the position and he came out here for during the interview process, I was praying for a good day of weather, a good sunny day in Sydney. I was, I was hoping that things went well to convince him to take on the job. But more importantly, on that occasion, when we chatted about what we'd done so far in New South Wales, where we wanted to go with Sydney Trains, I was so pleased that we shared a common vision, a common approach, and a common set of values in what customers deserve to get from us. Um, and, since, and since Howard's been in the job, I think it's been a month and seven days, but who's counting? Um, he's still got a smile on his face, and I think I've got a bigger smile because he's already made an enormous difference. And I think that together with the government, um, Howard and Rob and the whole team uh, will be really able to um, impress on our customers how far we've come and how far we will go to really bring world-class services here in New South Wales. So without further ado, it gives me great pleasure to um, welcome to the stage, Howard Collins.
Good afternoon, everyone. Um, yes, it is Howard Collins, and yes, I live in the Shire. <laughs> Uh, and I love my journey every day. So, so what have I got to tell you in 20 minutes or so? Do you know when I said to my staff in London, about 12 and a half thousand, I bumped into people and I said, I'm going to do a new job and it's going to be in Sydney. People's eyes light up when you mention the word Sydney. Because for people in the UK, it is one of those places where every day the sun shines, the surfers out there, it's a beautiful bridge, it's a fantastic place. And I think what persuaded me to come here was not only this fantastic city, but it is the fact that we have here the biggest challenge, the biggest opportunity to make a big difference for this great city. And I just wanted to be part of it. So I'm going to go through really what I've seen so far, I'll give you a little bit of uh, anecdotes. I could have told you stories about my four weeks uh, dealing with the London bombings, crawling around tunnels with the world's experts in forensic science. I could have told you about how I was part of the um, Olympics and the success, thanks to Sydney's advice about how to run Olympics, by the way. Uh, but I'm not going to tell you about that, because I really want to tell you about here and now and the future. So. What's going to be my insight on Sydney trains? Well, it could have just been a rebranding exercise. Um, and quite often in organisations, that's about it. And uh, you don't see much substance and change. But what I see is a significant, a significant change programme already on the way, but a significant opportunity. So I'm going to tell you about why I think our infrastructure is vital to Sydney. We are the arteries and veins of this great city. And before this patient has a heart attack or thrombosis, we have to do something about it. And the time is now. Our priorities, what am I going to focus on? What's the team, what Rob and I are going to focus on? And, and how that links up with, as Gladys talks about, the sort of commonality of our language when we first sat down. We had, uh, not even looking at sort of notes we shared earlier, it is a fact that the customer is the most important thing from my point of view. And I'd come from an industry where 30 years ago, Operators, engineers would say to me, Howard, this railway would be great if it wasn't for those passengers mucking the place up and getting in the way of a superb operational engineering skill. Wrong. We have to do things which really matter to the customer. I want to also talk about how we will improve. Not how we may improve, how we will improve. And also the opportunities our trains bring to this city as well. So you probably, you know, this is the point where I go into the facts mode of any speech. I blind you with figures, uh, normally putting up thousands of PowerPoint slides. Well, I assure you, after dinner, after lunch, you don't want any of that. All I can say is 306 million customer journeys were made last year on our rail network. We spent £3.8 billion operating the rail system of, you know, of this great city and spending, with your help, one and a half billion dollars on um, infrastructure in the last few, um, you know, last year. Very important that we continue to understand that. Every dollar in the ground on the public infrastructure is an important investment for us. It is vital, and why do I say that? Because I've come from a place in London where investment wasn't uh, priority. We sweated the assets. We ran trains, which were built in 1960. We ended up in a crisis position that I want no city to see again. And the winning formula was a combination of a new attitude and behaviour in terms of leadership, but also investment infrastructure for the long term. So as I said, we are the arteries and veins. We want to make sure we keep people running. And I've been in and out of Sydney for about 12, maybe 15 years. And what's the first thing I've noticed from when I first came here? 
the cars are pretty still in the centre of town, aren't they? No one really moves about very quickly nowadays. The traffic volumes in Sydney started to remind me of London its worst days. And people need a choice. And there's no good us saying, well, you know, come out of your cars and join the rail system if the rail system is not fit for purpose. You can buy a small compact car, air conditioning, the radio, you can be comfortable, you feel safe. What's the alternative? People have a perception at the moment that this place, you know, rail is not an alternative for many people. I want to change that. We have got to, as a rail system, relieve the burden on other modes. We've got to work in parallel with buses and ferries, be joined up, share information, and really improve our experience. And certainly, experience for customers is really, really important. I want to make, as in London, people's experience of travelling on the rail as something to be quite proud of. I want people in this, in this city to understand that there is a rail system here. Because one of the things my wife keeps reminding me as she's wandering around the city centre is, where are the stations? They're somewhere in those shopping prints somewhere, precincts somewhere. You know, there isn't this identity that you'll probably find in every street corner in London to guide you in, to lure you into the underground, to make sure you have a safe trip and get, get around the city centre. So we need to improve. <clears throat> Our existing customers, our friends from the press, remind us quite often that there are many shortcomings. It's a complex thing to run a railway, but there are many things I think we can improve upon. And uh, the current network, let me sort of describe how I've seen it. There has been poor reliability. There's no doubt that delays due to maintenance overruns or things breaking down are frustrating. There's certainly in the past been overcrowding in many areas. You know, the standard of trains in the past perhaps were dirty and stations were perhaps neglected in many ways. Uh, we were slow to respond to incidents, sometimes leaving the police to sort of, you know, take their time while they went through things and didn't worry about the 60,000 people stuck at Hurstville who wanted to get home. And so uh, maybe the staff weren't in the right place at the right time and perhaps they were more focused on their internal paperwork and processes rather than the customer. And there's no doubt, it's not just me who's putting pressure on changing things and Rob. It is the customer themselves are more demanding, expect bigger and better uh, you know, information. Information in London was uh, a trade secret held by staff for many years and would be metered out occasionally to customers when they really did demand it. Now um, you get information. In fact, a few of my customers in London used to complain they had too much information. But with the internet, with uh, apps, uh, you know where every single train is in London, where it's going, what it's doing. If you end up and landed from Mars, you just get your iPhone out, your app, and it tells you, you know, where the next bus is, what street you're on, where the next tube station runs from, are there any delays? In fact, now you can have your own website programmed in London so you have your own journey metered out. So if your train or your particular line gets delayed, you know about it, rather than the blanket sort of approach we'd applied in the past. So Sydney's not unique. It does have some very unique features. When you look at the rail system, you know, the first thing most of us would say, well, you wouldn't design it like this. It's grown over time. It's had a history of freight plus passengers. It's trying to do all things to all people in terms of um, a bit of a macrame set of weaving lines in. And you know, my task is to try and apply some simple processes and simple views to make it easier for the, the railway to operate. And you know, our customers do demand a better service. And we know we can do better. And yes, I've already been quoted as saying it reminds me of London 25 years ago. You know, a few people kick me about that occasionally, but it does. But there are some good things about this place as well. And I think that's something we must be quite clear about. We do need to improve reliability, <coughs> customer service, capacity, which I think is interesting. You know, we, here we've grown our trains to be bigger with more seats, longer, double decks. 
you get to a point where that solution can no longer increase unless we put three decks on trains and you know make the platforms even longer we have to look at an alternative which is out there now and uh, you know it does take time i'm not here to deliver a silver bullet or a quick fix i'm here for the long term i see sydney is my new home i see australia as my adopted country and that's really important to understand that i'm not going to be here for a quick fix and then go back home to the old country um, i really do feel this is an amazing city and i want to be part of its success in the future and I've used an analogy before. If we're going to make a difference, if we are going to make a difference, change will have to happen over a number of years. And it will require us to make big, brave changes. There are some challenges. It is a bit like being a tennis player and then asked to carry out open heart surgery while playing in that final running a rail system which is essential every day every weekend there seems to be some big event in sydney but we've also got to carry out that delicate surgery to get the patient in good health i think the other thing is that it has started before i arrived this is not about you know howard collins taking all the credit i think the why i decided to come here was the scene had already been set by government who I think with Gladys's personal, committed and customer focused style has meant that we really do understand what fixing the trains has meant. And I have walked in on the back of Rob's hard work in the last year in starting that reform program. Almost a thousand jobs have gone from what was Rail Corp and a reform program that I don't think any railway in the world has seen so applied so positively achieved in the last year. The trains are cleaner. They need to be even cleaner st still, as Rob and I know. There is less graffiti. And in London, we have no graffiti. And you just can't give up on that because it is an important factor that people understand. You've got to reduce the impact of engineering. We've got to make sure that I give Gladys the assurance on every Monday morning, all the bits of kit that we've taken apart are back together again and the railway's working once more. We've got to give good information, real-time information. And as I travel every day from Woolaware down to Central, I listen to the guard and some of them are fantastic. I find the time in the morning about 6.30 to get off and say to the guard, fantastic job. Occasionally, there are times when I think, I'm not sure people understood what you were saying. You went through the motions, but, um, and then we have another little chat. Um, but <clears throat> sometimes it's not about the individual, it's about the training, it's about understanding, it's about understanding why there are those challenges. But we do need to get better at information, very important. It is about people, this organisation, yes, I think there's huge potential with the right support from both the public and private sector to develop this rail system even further. But my style is about leadership by being visible, by walking about and being seen and heard by the staff. They have had a tough time, but it's great to see actually the people with the smiles on their faces, the people who are making a big difference, the occasional email I now get from customers already saying staff have been helpful, is about the positiveness that the majority of the people in, in our organisations are starting to feel. They feel there is a positive future. And let's be honest about this industry, this world industry of railways. It is the place to be. Different perhaps from motor manufacturing or maybe other areas of the business which is changing worldwide, rail is on the up. Every city in the world, every engineer in this room should be absolutely delighted that this future is about providing support for rail businesses around the world. And we're no exception. And it requires a lot of focus. Yes, we're going to remove even more top-heavy rail bureaucracy. We're going to simplify processes. I walk into the office and there's a number of forms. How do you fill this form in? You do this, you do that. It's great to be that naive POM who says, why do we fill this form in? 
Is this really necessary? Can't you get actually something on one sheet of paper rather than 60 pieces of paper that I can't understand? We will do that. It will make decisions more uh, uh, quick in response and it will allow my managers and the teams to feel more accountable. The other great news is again with support from a number of people over the last year 40% of our senior managers are new. Most of them are from the private sector. Most of them are from companies which you'd feel very proud of being associated with whether it's the banking sector, whether it's private industry, engineering, whether it's the service sector, particularly in the customer service sector, we have attracted some really good people. And they are championing at the bit to get on with the job. They just want clear direction from myself and Rob. They want to understand what the, the focus is and get on with the job. And I think that puts us in a huge advantage. We could have just reorganised the deck chairs and organised things so that you know, people were comfortable and not upset too many people. But you know, the minister made it quite clear to me, we need to start afresh. We need to make sure we got the right people, the right energy, the drive. But we're not losing that railway knowledge. You don't learn this business as I know just by picking up a textbook and reading it for five minutes. Many of the things that I dealt with in 1977, 8, only pop up again 30 years later. So retaining that railway knowledge, industry knowledge, plus bringing in some refreshing people make a big difference. If we improve our rail services, there's no doubt the knock-on effects will be huge for this city. Just one example, the Opal card. Hope you've got one in your pocket now. If you haven't, you're missing out. We have seen this product tried and tested elsewhere around the world, particularly in London 10 years ago. This is already changing people's lives. What's one of the most frustrating things as a customer when you want to go out and buy something? Queuing up, whether it's in my local Woolworths or whether it's you know, queuing up at a bank or something like that. We need to eliminate that and already the good uh, passengers, the customers of Bondi Junction have already said to me, in the Mondays we used to queue up, often 20 minutes, half an hour. Now there's no queue anymore. It gives me the opportunity to say, do we need all these people behind those thick glass screens? Can they come out and engage with the customers? It you know, reminds me of the banking industry 30 years ago when you used to go and get your $20 a week normally. That kept you going, didn't it, normally? Um, and my wife still tells me that's all I need. Um, you know, and you go up and sign a cheque and, uh, you know, and you get the cash and off you go again. You don't do that anymore. You know, the, the great advantages we have with, with Opal is that it opens the doors to even future technology. We know the journey times people make, anonymously of course, but we understand when people get delayed. We have the opportunity in the future to understand whether this technology can be transferred as it is in London onto your average card, your bank card, where you don't even have to think about travel, you've got it with you and you can be free to travel. It covers all modes. Instead of rummaging around saying, have I got the right pass for the bus or the ferry or it covers everything. It is a bold decision this, this uh, city has made and I'm delighted to be part of Opal and you'll see that take off in the future. So what's my immediate task? Well the first thing I learn is that uh, you walk before you run. You don't come in with bold ideas from, a, from another country let alone another state and say this is how you do it. You listen, you learn. You understand from Brian, who sells the tickets at Woolaware, what his problems are. What are the frustrations? You go out there and you talk to a thousand staff that I did in the first week and understand those issues. You talk to people like yourselves and understand what are the challenges for you, the frustrations perhaps that this large public bureaucracy has caused you, as often private sector um, suppliers, to your organisation and how we can work as one team. And I pass a comment about, you know, organisations. Is it public sector, private sector in the future? What's the mix? Is it a Melbourne story? Is it a Brisbane story or London story? I think it doesn't make a lot of difference apart from creating the sense of one team, one partnership working together. 
whether you're from the private or public sector. That's what makes the difference when those things drift away. So reform, as we call it, is going to continue. We haven't finished yet. There are many things we've got to do. We have to improve maintenance. Let me give you a little bit of experience. I think how maintenance uh, arrived in Railcorp over 100 or so years was the guys got a failure somewhere on the railway. They decided it would be good to hang around a bit to make sure this failure didn't occur again. So they went down to Bunnings and bought a shed. And they put a few tools and they put them in the shed. And then many, many years later, 127 maintenance points exist on the, the old railway, little sheds around. And just if you travel on the network, just look out the window occasionally and you'll see a shed with a rail court car and a few tools and a pile of spares. That's really what it was like. And it worked quite well in the fact that, you know, you, you had the local man and he knew exactly how to tweak the asset to just keep it going. Gavin Campbell, and from Qantas backgrounds, has really said, look, you want centres of excellence. You probably need a dozen places where you've got the right tools, a great working environment, somewhere where you can get people to focus on these things, rather than a scattered amateur type job that you've tried to do for many years. That is starting. And I would say taking um, lessons from Hong Kong is when you get a failure, the guys there don't give up until eventually the root cause, the real root cause has been fixed. So when the doors fail, you don't go back in the depot, give it an oil, works for a few days, fails again. You get in there and you understand what has caused that failure. It is that particular design of bearing or valve or whatever it is, which is you've got to fix and re-engineer quickly and do the whole fleet. The focus and the new guys we've got in the team will make a difference. How do I know that? Well, I saw a 22% reduction in asset failures in two years on the tube network, where people use that style of visualization, dealing with the top five failures, never letting go until they've been fixed, never giving up until we know that failure will never come back and haunt us again. Engineers, don't they? They have to say, well, this is a one-off, once in 30 years failure. Well, I don't want to hear that ever again. I want to know that we have proactively dealt with and sorted out those failures. And that's a big investment for us, and we will be working on that. Customer service. Can I just say a little bit about this? Um, I've already been accused of blaming the customers for the reason why there's long dwell times at stations. I didn't really say that, but what I wanted to say was, it is interesting when I went down to Circular Quay that we are doing a good job in trying to get people on and off. And, and the Sydney siders do a good job of getting off on our trains. But we just collectively, collaboratively need to work together to do even a greater job. Town Hall Station, if you've been down there, you might have seen some markings and lanes and you know, what's this all about? It is really trying to ensure that we can speed up those boarding and lighting times. And it's a challenge here. You know, the fact that every carriage has got staircases going up and down, the fact that you've only got two doors to get in and out, the fact that the trains are pretty full nowadays makes that challenge very difficult. But every five seconds we gain in improving that dwell time, shortening it, means that after 60 stops, you can do the maths, you can work out the train service will be that much quicker, more reliable and faster. There are more things we can do, and it will be interesting to see how you know, the different strategy that we are going to adopt on the North West Rail Link may actually change people's minds about what we need to do for the future of rail design and train design in this city. Information I've talked about, cleaning, if you go into an airport, if you go into a hotel, you'll see a different standard on railways. We need to improve those standards of cleaning. We need to get cleaning professionals into the job. Our core business is not crushing rocks in some um, you know, quarry somewhere or bending rails into shape at Bathurst or even doing that professional cleaning job. Our core business is running railways and I do see that we can gain a huge advantage by partnering in the future 
with the private sector in many of these areas. So in operations, we're going to bring in a new timetable in October. We're going to introduce more services. We're going to improve the speed of people's journeys, small steps at a time. We are going to change the seating layouts on one or two trains. And uh, we did a little trial and out on a Tangara train. And as, again, as a daily user, um, and I don't know whether many people do this, you've got uh, seats which have three spaces. I'd say 95% of the time that is apparently for bags. Yeah? I didn't realise that. I thought it was for another person. But it is embarrassing trying to ask someone who's, you know, got into their uh, iPhone 5 or whatever, would you mind, I want to sit in the middle there. So people don't bother. So why not make it two and two in some locations, give a bit more space, provide that standing room for 15 minutes for most people, and fully utilise the seating when we can. Just, a, just an example. It's already been christened the European seat. I, I think uh, that's very unfair. This is a, you know, going to be a Sydney seat as far as I'm concerned. Infrastructure, and that's where you guys come in. Um, there is no doubt, I believe, this is not a case of one side or the other winning. This is a case of us working in partnership, using the best of the private sector, demonstrating that we, in Sydney Trains, are a focused operator, a maintainer, we're efficient in what we do, but want to ensure we employ the resources in the best way. Sometimes that will be working in partnership with our private sector partners, and sometimes that will be doing things that we know best and uh, is still treated as core business. I'm a firm believer of getting things from around the world. Beg, borrow or steal, we will ensure Sydney gets the best. And the rail industry is a global industry. As many of you know who run global businesses, um, there are many good things out there that I think this city can use and deserves to use in the future. It does open great opportunities, whether it's PPP or other joint partnership and investment opportunities uh, for the future. And just coming down to it, Sydney is recognised around the world as being a world city. But it has competition on its heels. Nationally, you know, they talk about the rivalry between many of the cities in this country, but globally as well. And one of the decisions I'm sure a lot of these big global companies you see on the tops of all those buildings will be focusing on in the future is mobility. Can my clients, my staff, get around this city called Sydney? They will. If we get the right focus, if we continue in the strategy that the government has set out for us in New South Wales, we will have a real fighting chance to make sure that this city is the world city that it deserves. We have a choice. We're travelling down the road. We can take a turn in one direction to gridlock and staying there for the rest of our lives, gripping the steering wheel, wishing that you could move an inch or a centimetre. Or it is possible to, in the next few years, be really proud of this place to change perhaps even the most hardened Sydney cider to say, do you know what? I used to think you know, the rail system was pretty rubbish, but I actually will say that they do a pretty good job and things have improved. That's what I want to see. That's what I want to be part of. And thank you so much for listening.